Hey, a couple things before we get started. First of all, there are Bibles in the back of the room. If you need one, grab one. Don't be afraid to take it home with you because we want you to have it where you need it. If you don't have one or you need one in the office or in the car and need an extra one, just don't be afraid to grab those. That's what they're there for. The other thing is, if you need to communicate with the church for any reason, there are several ways to do that. If you grab the bulletin, you can fill out the bottom, the back of that. And uh, it's got a place for prayer requests and, and things. So if you want to put that in the offering bag or in the boxes on the way out, great. If you don't, didn't grab a bulletin, you can text the church. That's the easiest and quickest way. Text the church or email the church at info at come to crossroads.org. So if there's anything we can pray about, anything we can help you with, use the, those methods and connect with the church. I picked a scripture to open today, and it has to do with serving because... There have been, right now, there's probably 25 people from the church at the fair uh, serving this morning. And uh, we have, it's been a great week out at the fair. If you don't know, we've been collecting money at the gates. We go out every year and we serve at the county fair and we, we help them. And it's just so cool to get to be kind of plugged into the community like that. And uh, we've been a real blessing to them. And so I picked the scripture that kind of goes along with that. It says, you, I'm sorry, Galatians 5 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. It's just really cool to, to uh, be a part of a church that's doing that in so many different ways. So I wanted to say thank you. Let's pray and we'll get get moving. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you use us. And I praise you for the plan that you have for us. And, and Father, I just pray that you might um, remind us that you're always here with us. Your word says we're two or more gather in your name, Lord, that, that you're there with them. And, and Father, we just want to hear your voice. We want you to be what leads and teaches and, and touches our hearts today, Lord. And so we pray that we would keep our ears and our hearts open so that you might get the glory and you can build us up. We thank you and praise you for all that we have in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. How's everybody doing today? Good. You guys alive? Are you ready out there? First service was lit this morning. They were on fire. So you guys, let's stand up and let's connect our hearts with the hearts of the Lord this morning.
praise you, King Jesus, this morning. Amen.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. In one heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great.
every week we take some time and we open up the altar. And if you need prayer for something, there's people up here to pray with you and for you. But this song reminds me of a scripture in the Bible where Elijah, Elisha the prophet was being attacked and his servant looked out and saw the enemy and he thought, we're gonna die. And Elisha said, God, show him what I see. And he looked again and he saw chariots of fire and angels surrounding them. No matter what we're going through, don't forget that God promises he goes before us and he comes behind us. And even though things might look difficult in this life, God's not a God of this life. He's a God of eternity and he's a God of heaven and he's in charge of all of this. And so you might be surrounded by tough stuff, but remember that tough stuff is surrounded by God and that's why we pray. So if there's something you need to pray about, now's the time, the altar's open. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies With your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I find my battles And I be This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. And surely your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanks. This is how I fight my battles And I believe you've overcome And I will lift my song up Praise for all you've done This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles 
sing it out. Come on, let's declare it. It may look like. prayer my prayer is that we would never forget that we're surrounded by you Lord no matter what we go through no matter what we face no matter what difficulties in our lives Lord you promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us you promise to go before us and come behind us you promise that the shadow of your wings will provide comfort Lord you don't promise us it will be easy but you promise us that you've already overcome it and that you'll walk with us through this life and so father we pray for your presence we pray for your, your promises. We pray for your purpose. We pray, Lord, that you would be right there and that we would know it. Father, you, you're always there, but the, the thing is we have to understand that we can turn to you anytime. Father, help us to live in that promise. Help us to give you glory with all that we do, with all that we say, with all that we think, with how we navigate our, our jobs and our families and our live in our community, Lord. We just praise you. We thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. All right, well, hey, for the last couple of months, we've been going through the book of Mark, and we've been talking in the gospel of Mark about crazy things that Jesus said. And the sermon series has been called, Jesus Said What? I know. I I didn't really love it either, but what am I supposed to do? So, but today's the last day, and uh, what Jesus said today actually is an interesting, it's a scripture that has always interested me, because I've never really known what to do with it. It's the scripture where Jesus curses the fig tree, and the fig tree dies, and I've always kind of felt bad for the fig tree, you know? And I've never really known what was going on there. I've never looked into it real deeply, but um, we're going to dig through that today. Now, I do want to let you know that, that this scripture takes place in Holy Week. So it, it is the, a few days before Easter in terms of the Bible. Jesus has already gone to Jerusalem for the Passover, and, and that affects a lot of what's going on because in this fig tree, he, he shows us a metaphor. And, and we know that because he's really pushing back against the Pharisees, and he's challenging some of the things that are going on with the people. And, and that's the context that this scripture happens in. And so uh, I, I think it's a, a really interesting metaphor that he uses for the fig tree, that he uses the fig tree for. Now, as we've talked about before, it's always really important that when we read the Bible, we understand that context. And not only is that context uh, the, the week before that he goes to the cross, but this particular story has two parts. He withers the fig tree, he, he curses the fig tree, And then you have another story that happens in between that most of us know where Jesus gets mad and he turns over the the tables in the temple. And then we have more of the story of the fig tree. And that's really important as we read through this because it helps us understand that the story that's in the middle where Jesus turns over the, the, the tables in the temple, that goes along with the fig tree story. The fig tree story is on both sides of it. And, and we know that, so, so when we read this, they all fit together to form this one story. And, and that should, it should inform how we, how we interpret the story of him turning over the tables in the temple because of the, the story of the withered fig tree. So we're in Mark chapter 11, and uh, we're going to be in verses 12 through 25 today. And the story starts out like this. It says, the next day... That was Monday, by the way. Palm Sunday, he comes in. The next day, Monday, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when they reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Okay, so the story begins with this cursing of the fig tree. And it says it wasn't the season for figs. And he cursed this poor tree. 
And so I've always read that and thought, I don't get that. Why would Jesus curse a tree? It wasn't even fig season. Well, there's a lot more to this story, and and I began to kind of work through it from the beginning. First of all, I'm pretty sure this is a metaphor. I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't just hungry, and I know that because, oh, let me see, there's another story where he feeds 5,000 people with two loaves and a fish, so he could probably make food if he wanted it. And there's another story where he he tells Peter to go get a, a fish, and there's a coin in its mouth, and go pay his taxes. I like to combine those two stories. He tells Peter to go get a coin and then has him stop at Subway on the way back. Okay? Jesus can make food. Not a problem. So I'm pretty sure he wasn't just cursing the tree just because he was hungry. Okay? But then I began to dig a little deeper and find out more about the fig trees. And and here's the thing. The rich people would only eat figs. But poor people knew that if a fig tree had leaves, it also had buds. And the buds are edible too. So Jesus wasn't worried about figs. He saw a tree that had leaves. He knew it should have something to eat, even if it was just the buds. And and so the the lesson here is that a tree that, that has any leaves should be bearing some kind of fruit. And if you think about that, and Jesus is in the midst of the Pharisees where he's getting ready to condemn the Pharisees for who they are, what this metaphor is and what this commentary is about is faith that looks good. We got leaves, but it's not really bearing any fruit, okay? This is about going through the motions or looking the part of faith, but not really digging in. And, and that is a picture of the Pharisees. They went through the motions. Constantly in the scriptures, we see Jesus calling the Pharisees out because they go through the motions, but they're really not doing anything for God. They're not doing him any good. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people in our culture and probably in this church have the same idea. We go through the motions. We dress up. Most of us know how to speak Christianese. Okay, we put our T-shirt on, says, I love Jesus. But are we really doing things that bless the kingdom, that build other people up, that give God cause to say, well done, good and faithful servant? Okay, that's the commentary, that's the metaphor that Jesus is is giving when he curses that fig tree. And I can just imagine Jesus got up and he was probably hungry. And he saw a tree and he was like, yes. And then he saw no fruit and he thought, ugh, just like them Jews. That's exactly what he was going through. And unfortunately, that, that, that metaphor applies to us 2,000 years later if we have lives that look the part but aren't really getting to the core of what God's called us to do. So that's kind of what, what this whole thing is set up by. Okay, so let's, let's dig into the next part and see how he applies this. And it says, verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem... And that's where they were headed. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables uh, of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said... Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Okay, so... Jesus is frustrated by the fact that we, we look the part, but we don't um, fulfill or bear any fruit. And, and the commentary for the tree reminds us that no matter where you are, and I missed this in the beginning when I was talking about the tree, no matter where you are in your faith, you should be bearing fruit. Okay? Some of us are going to bear figs. If we've been at this a long time, you, know, you might lead people to Christ. You might have all kinds of success. Other people, maybe they're new in their faith, but they should be doing something. Something that, that, that benefits the kingdom. 
Okay? And I love the fair as a wonderful example. When we worked the fair this week at the gates, I see all these different people, and you're connecting with all these different people. And you'll have people working the gates who, who are evangelists. And in like the two seconds that they meet someone, they're trying to lead them to Jesus. Whoa, whoa, whoa come on. We're just, we're collecting money here. That's good, good try. Okay? Other people, they're just, you know, hey, how are you? But what I love is when people who are trying to lay low see a friend. Hey, what are you doing here? Oh, well, my church does this. Oh, what church you go to? Oh, I, I go to Crossroads. We got them. Okay? It doesn't matter how big or little. If you show up and do your thing, you'll bear some fruit, no matter where you are on the, the spectrum of faith. But you've got to be available and usable for God. Okay, so that's the commentary. So, so Jesus shows up in Jerusalem and already irritated that he's been reminded that the people of God at the time, the Jews, aren't bearing any fruit. They're just going through the motions. And he walks into this scene where he sees them uh, doing all the wrong things. And so he gets angry. And he starts turning over tables. And he starts lecturing them on spirituality. And what he, what he does is remind us what, what our empty faith sometimes looks like. If you read through this, we get a picture of exactly what places our faith tends to, to hit a wall, tends to be empty, what areas of our lives we have leaves but no fruit, okay? First thing, who, what's he do? Money changer, you're gone. And how many of us, how many Christians do you know that money and God just don't mix, okay? Well, all the church is after is my money. God doesn't need our money. He wants our hearts. But you want to see where somebody's heart is? Look at their checkbook. And by the way, I'm not talking about the 10%. I'm not talking about the tithe you give to the church. I'm talking about the other 90. What do you do with that? Okay? If you're not saving it to provide for your family, and you're not paying off your, your, your debt, and you're not using that to bless the people around you, I've said this before, you can give 10% to the church, but if you spend the other 90 on booze and women, you're in trouble. Okay, that's the, that's the picture we get ourselves in. And people hoard their money. Some people give their money and think, I'm okay, I gave to the church. But every penny you have should reflect who God is. And so money has this way, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money has this way of coming between us and God. So that's the first commentary he made. Okay, and then he talks about the doves. He says he turned over the money changer's table and the tables of the, the people selling doves. Well, you have to understand what was going on here. It was the Passover. And if you were Jewish, you had to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It was hard to do somewhere else. The rules say you had to come to the temple. You had to sacrifice a certain animal in a certain way at a certain time. Okay? Well, number one, if you lived somewhere else and you were Jewish, you would travel in. You wouldn't have any money. If you did, it would be money from another country. So you'd have to get uh, Jewish money. Denari, well, what would happen? You'd say, I'll give you one denari. They'd say, well, I'm gonna give you half that back. You'd give them money from your country and they would take a big cut, okay? Same thing with doves. How much does a dove cost? I don't know. But whatever it costs, they'd charge three times as much. Why? Because you had to have one. So not only were they, were they um, not really worried about God's kingdom, about fruit. They're worried about themselves. They were using religious things to get rich. Okay, so Jesus was irritated. And so the money was a problem, but the doves were the problem. They were selling, doves represent hope, they represent peace, and in the scriptures they represent the Holy Spirit. They were selling a fake bill of goods to people. And, and I think that's what happens. People have a, a, a fake faith in terms of they, they're sold something that isn't true. I love it when people say, oh, just give your life to Jesus, everything can be great. What part of take up your cross and follow me is great? Things might not be great. They might be hard. They might be difficult. It's a lot harder to do the right thing than to do whatever you want. But they'll be great for eternity, okay? And eventually, it might take five years or ten years. Eventually, if you do what God says, your life will be better. God promises that he'll bless us. It might not be prescribed the, the way we would prescribe it for ourselves, but God promises he'll take care of us. Okay, but they were selling false goods. 
And, and this was because their faith was fake. And then the, the faith of the people that they sold it to is fake. Okay, so, so this is the whole setup that you have here. And Jesus, it, 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 it makes him angry. By the way, I love when people say, well, God is love. He is love. And, and he's always 100% love. And he's also always 100% wrath. He's both at the same time. And, and I would argue that God gets more upset about people who say they believe in Jesus but don't do anything with it, don't have anything to show for it, or they fake it than he does for people who've never heard of Christ at all. Okay? We, we sometimes get in our little holy huddle and we point fingers. Oh, look at those people. Okay? He's, I think he's more upset about the people who go through the motions, the fig trees who have leaves but no fruit, than he is about people who've never heard. Okay, so, so this is what's going on here. These guys are going through the motions and Jesus sees an example of it and, and he puts his foot down. Then it says, not only the doves and the money, but he wouldn't let them carry merchandise through. What, what's that about? Well, your faith, your belief, your, your understanding of who God is is not made to be a shortcut. Okay, it's not just an, a free trip to heaven. That's what I think a lot of people think. Well, I've been baptized I went to church, I got baptized, I told God, oh, him and I were okay, so I'm good. That, it's not like a bus pass, okay? And the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. I don't know who's going to heaven and who's not. I don't know what's going on in people's heart. But it also says that those people who know God, they do godly things. You can judge a tree by its fruit. And so it's not a shortcut. These people were just using God as a shortcut to get what they wanted. That's not how this works. Okay, that's not genuine faith. That's leaves that make a tree look good, but they don't really bear any fruit. So this whole thing is a commentary. Jesus tipping over the tables is a commentary on what fake faith looks like. And, and he, he talks about money, he talks about peace, he talks about shortcut, then he talks about prayer. And I love that we have a lot of people who pray, but... I'm going to be honest with you. I think sometimes we get the wrong idea of prayer. Two things about prayer. I know that people ask other people to pray a lot. Pray for so-and-so. I don't want to be mean, but sometimes I want to say, you pray for so-and-so. I don't even know so-and-so. Okay? And, but, but sometimes we think that there's like this magical bat phone. That's not how it works. God wants your heart. The simple motions of going through something don't matter. Now, I will tell you that when you call me or call the prayer line and you ask for prayer, you get it. We earnestly pray. But I would argue that the prayers of the person who are connected to that person, who have an emotional tie to that person, are more relevant. And even more than this, God, help so-and-so. We should maybe say, God, I'm going to shut up and let you tell me how I can help so-and-so. <gasps> oh, boy. That's the commentary here. Jesus says, oh, you ask for stuff all the time. How about you be quiet and let me tell you what to do? That's real prayer too. I would argue that's more real prayer than what we normally offer up. And I know this is what he was talking about because remember, he's confronting the Pharisees and he always confronts the Pharisees about prayer. There's a dozen times in the scripture where he tells the Pharisees, oh, you pray empty prayers, you pray empty prayers. Okay, so, so the, this, is, this is what empty faith looks like. This is what leaves with no fruit look like in our lives. Now, here's the problem. In 19, in verse 18 or 19, it says they're going to kill him. The Pharisees get together and decide, we got to kill Jesus, which was great for us. Okay, they thought they were hurting him, but actually they were saving us because he paid the price for our sins. God had this whole thing worked out. But... In this story, what, what them deciding to kill Jesus shows us is that in the areas where your faith isn't genuine, in the areas where you're going through the motion, eventually at some point, you're going to come to a place where you've got to make a decision. You're either going to realize that that faith has no power, that, that, that there's no fruit. If there's no fruit, you got nothing. Or you're going to get confronted in some way where you've got to make a decision. God, I need your help. And at that moment, there's going to be a, a big decision to make. God's going to show up. If you invite Jesus into your house and your faith is fake, guess what he does? He starts turning over tables. 
And we got to be willing to go through that personally in the areas that, that we're not complete. Or what do we do? We say, ah, he's not real. I'm out. One or the other is going to happen. My prayer for most of us is that it happens now and not when you're, when you're on your deathbed realizing that your life has been wasted. Okay? But eventually your life gets to a place where you've got to make a decision. I'm going to follow him or I don't believe in him. And this empty faith is sometimes where we get confronted. Okay, but it's going to happen. If you're sitting here today and you're believing and you say, I know that God is real and I know there's a God in heaven and I know Jesus died on a cross. And then the next line in that sentence is but. And you can think of areas in your life that aren't lined up with his will. If that's the case, then he's going to show up in those areas at some point, now or later. You can call him and say, hey, how about I help you with the table? That, that'll expedite the process, make it easier on you. you learn more that way. Or you can wait till a crisis happens, and he'll start doing it. But either way, you're going to have a decision to make. That's what fake faith does. It, it looks the part, but it has no feet. Okay, it has no muscle. And when you get in trouble, God has to clean up your mess before he can then help you. And I don't want you to go through that. That's why our faith should be genuine, which is what Jesus gets to in the next part. Because, well, let's just read the next part and we'll see. Starting in verse 20. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree. So they went in, tipped over the tables, and they went out Back now, it's Tuesday morning. It says, in the morning they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, look, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And now Jesus gives him an explanation of the fig tree and basically tells him how not to have empty faith. Jesus says, verse 22, have faith in God. See, that line is why I knew this whole thing was about faith. Why I knew that tree was a metaphor for, for empty faith. Jesus says, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Okay? So Jesus says, let me tell you something. The tree didn't have any faith. Of course, trees don't have faith, but he was saying this is a metaphor. Okay? I don't want you to be like this tree. Look the part, but no fruit. So you have to have faith. And the problem is, we, as 20th century or 21st century human beings, Westerners especially, Americans, we read that, and we see the word faith, and we know what faith means, right? It means that we know it up here. We have head knowledge. We believe it. In fact, in another, the next verse, he uses the word believe. Okay, we, we know it up here. Here's the problem. That's not at all what Jesus was talking about. That, that dualism of believing something for us is separated from doing something. We know it. Okay, I know that's true. But, but in Jesus' time and in the Greek, there is no separating the knowing and doing. Okay, Jesus basically, and, and when you read all through the scriptures, I, I love... Um, Proverbs 3, one of my favorite scriptures, most of you know this, okay? Lean, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's that same word, trust, okay? And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. See, trusting, the belief, is tied to the living. He'll make your path straight. It's the same thing in, he, in Timothy. Paul told Timothy, okay? Flee from all, all unrighteousness. Pursue the good things, Okay, pursue godliness and faith and love and fight the good fight of faith. Knowing who God is is connected to doing the right things. Here's the thing. The faith that you have can't just be an empty head knowledge. I know God is God and I know Jesus died on a cross. So what? So do the demons, James says. 
What are you gonna do with it? And, and, and the beautiful thing is, when Jesus reads, describes this thing, you know, I read this, and, and so basically, here's, here's how you don't have empty faith. And he describes this. You know what's not in here? Going to church is not on the list. Reading your Bible is not on the list. <gasps> but pastor, those are the things you always tell us to do, okay? Hanging out with other Christians, not on the list. Why? Here's why. Because you can do those things for the wrong reasons. Those things can become the leaves that make you look Christian, but don't really have any bite to them. They have to be uh, undergirded. They have to be supported. There has to be a foundation of, of a faith that says, whatever God says I'm going to do. A faith that says, since I know it's real, I'm going to do it. And when you have that kind of faith, and then you do those things, they, they change you. But if you do them without that kind of faith, they do nothing, okay? And so, so it's, it's really, Jesus is really getting at the foundation, not just the how-to, but the why. And, and now you look at this, and he says, okay, have faith. Now, I'm going to describe faith. Faith moves mountains. Now, do you really think that you could say to a mountain, move, and it would? Now, there may be people who say yes, and I'd have to say, I think so, but... Because what Jesus was saying was a hyperbole. And a hyperbole is like, if you ever catch a fish, well, if you're a fisherman, fish. You know, they said, that fish was huge. Okay, cranes are huge. Fish are not huge. Okay, it's a hyperbole. So Jesus was making a point. How do I know he's making a point? Because Jesus never told a mountain to move. Think about it. But what he is saying is, listen, anything is possible if you're doing what God says to do. This is a commentary on lining our will up with God's will. That's what faith is. We have this idea that faith is believing. I believe I can raise that Kleenex box. Okay, this isn't the force, okay? It's not about silly things. What faith is is saying, I don't care what I want. I want what God wants. And if you begin to put yourself in a place where whatever you want comes from God, then all of a sudden you begin to see things change in your life. And this is the opposite of the fig tree. The fig tree had lots of leaves and it was beautiful, no fruit. If you say, I want to be who God wants me to be, you might only have one leaf, but it's enough to make fruit. And this is the commentary that, that Jesus is giving him. And, and so he says, you've got to believe in a way that changes how you live and changes how you think and changes how you act. And then, and he says, if you do that, things begin to happen, okay? And he says that twice. You can move a mountain and whatever you ask for, it'll, it'll, it'll happen, those are preceded by this idea that your will becomes God's will, okay? Or God's will becomes your will. And then he finishes with this one thing, and it seems out of place at first because he's talking about believing, and he's talking about believing and doing, going together, and that's f leaves and fruit, and it's this wonderful metaphor. And then he says, oh, by the way, don't forget to forgive people. Does it just me or does that seem out of place? It's not out of place because what's the biggest thing that God has done for us? Your will, your will has to flow out of God's will. What's God's will? God's will was that all are forgiven. And how can we expect to have our lives line up with God's life if we don't forgive? Remember earlier I talked about how many people struggle with money? I would argue even more people struggle with unforgiveness. There's somebody or something that has happened in their lives that they cannot let go of. Why? Because your life isn't about him, it's about you. And this is one area that Satan continually uses to trip people up. God forgave you. If you forgive others, your heart just opens up to his will. And if his, your heart opens up to his will, then... Fruit begins to grow on those leaves. 
It's this, it's this beautiful pattern, and it's a pattern modeled after him. He forgave. You know, when, when we first walked out of the Garden of Eden, he had already forgiven us. He already knew what he was going to do. That's what he's talking about. We, we know what we're going to do. You, you know what you're going to do this afternoon. And you say, but how can I know? Because you know you're going to do whatever God says to do. See, most of us look at life and we say, well, when I get there this afternoon, I'll ask God what he wants. You don't have to ask. Just do what he wants. That's faith. Think about the Old Testament. I think about all the saints in the Old Testament who had no idea that Jesus was who he was. They were, they were 2,000 years, or David was 1,000 years before Jesus, but David said, God's gonna do something, and whatever he does, it's gonna be awesome, and I'm gonna be a part of it. That's faith. And, and most of us think that we're driving the boat. But if you want fruit to grow on those trees with leaves, okay, don't have God be your co-pilot. Let God be the pilot. Jesus be the co-pilot. Holy Spirit can be the navigator. You just serve coffee in the back. Be a steward, okay? That's the attitude. And Jesus says, if you don't have the attitude, all the other stuff doesn't matter. All the other stuff doesn't matter. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that you show us that we have to know who you are and want to follow you, be hungry to serve you, if all of the other stuff is gonna make a difference. And I pray, Lord, that we are not trees who look the part with leaves but have nothing to show for it. Help us to be productive, Lord. And not just productive with stuff, Lord, but, but for your kingdom, with people. Father, making a difference in the world because you forgave us, because you love us, because you called us to that purpose. We just praise you, Lord, and we'll continue to praise you with all that we have. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in a minute, we're going to take communion. I want to remind you again, please connect with the church. If there's something that you need, if we can pray for something, if we can help you in any way, please either text the church, email the church, or fill out a bulletin and, and put it in the, in the box on the way out. We pray every week as a staff, and um, if there's anything we can do to help you, we will. And as we come to the communion table, it's a pretty simple jump. You know, we take communion every week and we remember what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice, okay? And, and you talk about not empty words. God said, I'm gonna take care of it. And he showed up and he died on a cross himself because Jesus was God in the flesh to take care of it. And he knew he was gonna, and David knew he was gonna. And guess what? He's gonna take care of you. You just have to know that faith means if he's real, I'm going to do what he says, period, end of discussion. And that will be fruit on your tree. Let's pray. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to learn from your example. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name's Mark Pritchard. I'm the associate pastor here and one of the elders in um, you know, I grew up in church, and praise God for that. Um, went to a lot of different churches, heard a lot of different offering meditations, too many to count. And most times, they were either like a sales pitch or like using scripture to sort of shame you into giving money, and I was always kind of weird about that. And then you'd hear, well, you know, we're on a 10-year project to build a stained glass window with our money or we're going to send it to this missionary that nobody knows about and nobody from our church ever goes but it, trust us it's it's good stuff you know here you don't have to worry about that you guys are so giving and the elders of this church are so dedicated to honor that giving and to build his kingdom 25 percent right off the top goes out there is a TV right through these doors on the right, as you go out on the right, that has every single mission. Do yourself a favor. Take 10 minutes and watch that and see. And not only does the money go there, but our people go there. Every mission is vetted to make sure they are doing God's work. And then on top of that, outside of that, just in the last month, we had a children's camp with 100 children. We had... Um, 
upward volleyball camp. We had VBS. We had people working at the fair. We had our youth go to Cincinnati and serve families. I mean, I could stand up here for an hour and list how much fruit comes out of this small little body in Wintersville, Ohio. It's awesome. You don't need a sales pitch. You don't need to be guilted into money. God says he loves a cheerful giver. Give what you determine to give. But know this, we are dedicated, dedicated to making sure your money is stewarded well. So keep on giving because God just keeps on multiplying it. It's just an awesome thing how his kingdom works. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this opportunity to give back a portion, just a small portion of the overwhelming blessings you pour out all the time. You are good all the time, and we praise you. Bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand. couple things before we get prayed out of here. First of all, uh, the text to give. A lot of you give digitally. If you text to give, that has changed. We've changed providers. So there's the new information, and that's on the website. If you know how to text to give, you probably know how to look it up on the website. So uh, go to the website if you have any problems. Also, uh, next Sunday, you know, every eight weeks, uh, Pastor Mark does a, a class. It's kind of a, it's not really a welcome to Crossroads class. It's called... Yes, the Bible, I always leave one thing out. The Bible, Crossroads, and You, Fruit for Christian Living. It's a great class about the history of the church, the history of this church, a lot of Bible, uh, how to study the Bible, uh, how to give you testimony. It's a really neat class. So if you haven't been through that class, um, you can sign up online, and it, it starts next Sunday. Um, they meet first service, you come to church second service. And then I want to let you know a couple of ladies things that are going on. Ladies retreat is coming up. We have signups going on in the lobby for the next three weeks. The other thing I want to let you know, ladies, is I'm going to be speaking in a couple of other churches and I'm taking registration forms to other churches. So if you want a bottom bunk, you need to sign up first to make sure that you get them. Because over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be speaking and there may be a lot of people from other places signing up. The other thing is September the 9th, we are going to go back uh, and have women's Bible study for the 9th and the 16th. Uh, two weeks of focusing on Holy Spirit, getting us all ready for the retreat, which is like that following weekend. So it's going to be an awesome and amazing time. Bring your friends and get ready. Cool. Okay. So two weeks leading up to the retreat, Bible study. Um, a couple things. There's no men's group tonight. Sunday night men's group is not meeting tonight. And I want to let you know, we, we talked about missions a little bit. We have several teams that go out all over the world. Our first missions trip for 2020 will be the Thailand trip. And it is January 28th to February 11th. 
January 28th to February 11th. If you want to go to Thailand, it is a two-week trip because it's so far, and um, but it's one of our cheaper trips. Probably thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars is all. That includes airfare and everything, and you have to have a passport. So if you're interested in going on that trip, uh, see one of the elders or or uh, text or email the church. After I pray, we need to stack the last I don't know seven rows of chairs for the youth group to have some fun tonight. So uh, let's pray and we'll be done. Lord, we, uh, we give you all the glory. And, and Father, we just, as we leave here, we want to be people, Lord, who are proclaiming your name and how we live. And we know that begins at a foundational level, Lord, with what we believe. And help us to have faith that isn't just about what we know on our heads, because that's just empty leaves on a tree, Lord. But help us to have faith that is always ready and willing to be who you called us to be, do what you call us to do, because that's the fruit. And Lord, we don't even know what that is yet, but we know that you're good and you're gonna love us and you're gonna show us and you're gonna help us through it. So help us to be ready and the kind of faith that changes the world. We praise you and thank you for all we have in Jesus' name, amen.